Warning. The following podcast contains two morons talking about sophisticated subject matter, like ninus and hoo-hahs. Also, a few whoopsie-daisies and at least one house or ante. If you don't have a strong stomach, you know where the door is. Right. On with the shenanigans, then. The podcast which you are about to hear is an account of the tragedy which befell two washed-up losers. In particular, Court Psyops and his immature co-host, Matt. It was all the more tragic in that they were uncultured morons. But had they lived very, very full lives, they could not have expected nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see each week. For them, an idiotic podcast show became a nightmare. The events of each week were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, Cinema Psyops, with Court and Matt. What is Psyops? Psyops for psychological operations is very simply the art of influencing how people feel and think and ultimately how they behave and what they do. You don't have to defeat the enemy on the battlefield. It's better if you can convince the enemy to do what you want him to do without having to fight him. And that's really the intent behind Psyops, to convince people to do what you want them to do. So how does Psyops fit into what's happening now? The two points I'd like to make with you and the audience is that first and foremost, Psyops saves lives. The second thing I'd like to say, a lot of people have misconception about PSYOP. They think it's something devious and brainwashing. You say you don't know exactly what's going on right now, but we do know that there are some PSYOPs going on, right? Ma'am, I don't know. Cinema PSYOPs. And I believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. Why I believe that is because I know how it feels. I know what it does to you. Cinema PSYOPs. They think it's something devious and brainwashing. of Cinema PsyOps. I'm your host and the purveyor of the perverse bullshit podcast that is this show, Court, and joining me live via Skype is my co-host, Matt. Anybody want any barbecue or, I don't know, maybe some chili or something? Oh, I got a lot of stuff to get into about that barbecue. Yeah. A lot of stuff. Slow and low, baby. Fat cap up. So, oh yeah, fat cat above. You gotta let the fucking fat moisturize the rest of the meat and add flavor to it. <laughs> Come on. I feel That's like amateur most, hour. I feel like most of your complaints in this franchise of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is gonna be the technique with which they barbecue human meat. And you're gonna develop a plan that's gonna be better that will get you on an FBI watch list. Probably, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Dude, I know you, you're gonna fucking do it. <laughs> oh, I already have so many problems right now. <laughs> <laughs> with how they handle the barbecue. Yeah. I, I'm just glad that when we covered Motel Hell all those ages ago, it was before you really, really got into the barbecue and stuff. Like, no, really? I was still really into barbecue, but I never saw them cooking. And also, the one thing I'm going to have a problem with, they didn't uh, they, they didn't have that problem in Motel Hell. Because I was way big into barbecue in Motel Hell. Okay, but cool. Yeah, I didn't I... see how they cooked, but my <laughs> problem, which I'll get into later, is, is, is different. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really interested in that. So, yeah. but dude, this is 300 fucking straight. Well, not straight, consecutive, because there's really not much that's straight about this podcast. Other Nothing than the all. straights I mean, that we scare. <laughs> I mean, buy at best. <laughs> <laughs> like maybe by curious at our most straight, but even yeah. but even then we're like I don't know, man. Maybe, uh, maybe <laughs> I just, I'm telling you, I'm not exactly sure what's going on around here anymore. <laughs> All I know is I feel funny in my britches. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, I am so fucking amped up. So I put the call Woo. out for some feedback from everybody, and uh, I did it on Facebook and everything, and we got some answers. We got some some stuff back. We got a, a solid amount of feedback as well. So we probably might have enough to where we're going to have to skip the news. I don't know. We'll, we'll see okay. how long it takes us to get through the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And I told Matt this off mic, and, and now I'm just going to put it out there for everybody. So now I can't go back and say that this isn't true and that I was lying to him to make him feel better. Uh, Matt's doing the notes for Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is one of my all-time favorite horror movies. And now everybody's like, yes. but why are you trusting Matt to do it? Well, I feel like he's earned it. I feel like That's right. he's, he's gotten to the right position. You've, you've done enough insight over the last couple of episodes since you've taken over the sole reviewership to where I also feel lazy enough to not want to do my favorite movie anymore in podcast. I mean, to where I trust you to, All right. <laughs> to handle it. Let's, let's already get into the notes. Um, back in the 70s in Texas, there's a Chainsaw Massacre. The end. Okay. Great show, everybody. Let's get to those reviews about us. <laughs> wow. <It's> just <laughs> fucking... All the goodwill I had built up with the people, and it's just all fucking gone, all I, because I, of you. I, that's kind of that's how I live. <laughs> that's, that's that's where I come from. <laughs> Instantly destroying any goodwill built up around him at all times. If Matt too many people start like doing the work I'm doing, I typically find a way to self sabotage that shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that explains your career path. Yes, real big time. All right. Career path, marriage, all of it. All right, enough pablum. I, I have a, a little bit of show housekeeping. I want to get started like right off the bat. Right. Um, you probably remember this. Um, this isn't really about the, the, the 300 episodes and then also, um, you know, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre full franchise fest. This has to do with um, our, both of our obsessions now. Um, Raiko, Raiko, Ike, and the Sex oh. and Fury film. You may remember when we covered that, I was lamenting that there was no high definition transfer. There was no Blu-ray of that anywhere to be found or, or even purchased online or anything like that. And I had Jason Spear, who refers to himself as the head goon of the Rieko Ike and Laura Gemsner Appreciation Society. Hey, all right. Yeah. Yeah, he hooked me up. That's a that's a hell of an appreciation society. <laughs> <laughs> well, considering that Sex and Fury has both of them in there, why wouldn't you appreciate them both and mm -hmm. form a society around that? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, I, I got hooked up with a Toei TV rip that's 1080i, and I checked it out earlier today. I kind of was like uh, watching it instead of working, and uh, it looks yeah. amazing. It's awesome. Nice. I'm super happy. <laughs> so maybe if you're a good boy, Matt, I will hook you up <laughs> with yeah. the same file so that you can have a high-definition version of that uh, completely naked sword fight to watch at your leisure until your wife finds it and deletes it. I mean, what the hell? <laughs> Keep it on the PSYOPs thumb drive. It'll be fine. That's it. Uh, you know, as long as I'm not watching it in front of her, I don't think she cares. Yeah. Well, even if you're watching it in front of her, she'd probably enjoy it. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much, Jason, for hooking me up with that. And then also the Rieko, Ike, and Laura Gemser Appreciation Society. You guys want to hook us up with some more copies of this kind of level of yeah, just if awesomeness. Any, if there's any like, Laura Gemser Appreciation stuff you could send us, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my dude, have I got plans for you in year six. I don't, I don't got a problem. You all have a problem. <laughs> You don't have a Laura Gemsner problem. What you have is a lack of Laura Gemsner supply to your yeah, demand. Exactly. <laughs> well, we'll we'll definitely work on that. But yeah, I got I got some stuff planned for you for your six, my dude. So you'll all you'll, right, you'll be doing all right. So let's uh, let's stop fucking around. Everybody wants to hear about our thoughts on Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, and then we'll celebrate us afterwards. But let's get to the part that people want to hear. Word up. This will keep you quiet. <laughs> oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You call me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash legionpodcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, 
You can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash Legion podcasts. We appreciate it. And thank you for listening. Now back to the cutting room. You're probably like, what the fuck is this? Why the fuck is Court playing that? Actually, it made kind of sense. Oh, the Fool for a Blonde song? Well, it, it, just from the sounds of it. it. sounds like something you might hear in Texas back in those days in a small little town. Funny you should mention that, because when they're in the graveyard, that's the song that's playing in the background on the redneck guy sitting there on the back of the truck si- sipping beer. They're, I can know it. They're playing that song during that, so that's that's why I grabbed it. Uh, this is another one of those, grab the soundtrack right out of the fucking movie, so everybody really cool about this, okay? Everyone just, just be fucking cool. There's no reason. Yeah, there's no reason need, to be douchebags. Don't need anybody coming after us, all right? <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a lot worse next week when we do uh, Texas Chainsaw 2. I don't know how I'm going to skirt the copyright laws and include that amazing music that's in that one. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what I don't have to worry about copyright laws for, Matt? What's that? This trailer. Hey! This is the movie that Rex Reed called the most horrifying motion picture I have ever seen. This film is positively ruthless in its attempt to drive you right out of your mind. It accomplishes everything it sets out to do with brilliance and unparalleled terror. This is the horror movie to end them all. motion picture I have ever seen. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. All right, let's fucking do it. Oh, yeah. All right. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. First 20 minutes. Well, hey, you know what? We got a narration that starts out. Welcome back after a month-long hiatus clips. With our first clip. The film that you are about to see is an account of the tragedy which befell a group of five youths. In particular, Sally Hardesty and her invalid brother, Franklin. It is all the more tragic in that they were young. But had they lived very, very long lives, they could not have expected, nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see that day. For them, an idyllic summer afternoon drive became a nightmare. The events of that day were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. 
fucking Dan from Night Court telling us what's up in Texas with the chainsaws. Was that John Larroquette? That was John Larroquette. Just a little bit of side note. I think he owed someone a favor, and that's how he ended up doing that narration, but that was before, obviously, Night Court and everything like that, because this yeah, is like 73 well, course, when yeah. this was shot. So yeah. there you go. That's John Larroquette's voice. Dan from that's Night awesome. Court. That's awesome. I just expected, like, when I first was listening to it, I'm like, I just expected him to call them uncultured morons. <laughs> yeah. Anybody who was um, adept enough at deciphering my my very, very <laughs> obvious code with the intro for this year. Yeah. <laughs> I have no surprise that we're covering the Texas Chainsaw franchise. <laughs> All right, well, we see it's August 18th, 1973. We know this because the movie tells us. Thank you, movie. Uh, <laughs> it it's helps. Just, it's just convenient. It helps. It's just convenient. You're, you're, doing, you're doing the Lord's work. You're, you're really uh, helping Matt out to find out what time and what place he's currently living in. Yeah, uh, it really does help me because I get lost real easily and it makes me cry. Um, and I've so seen anyway, that, so it's true. <laughs> we hear some grunting and then the we, you hear that, the, that sound of the photo being taken. That's such a cool sound, too. Yeah. Really it adds eeriness. And you can, we see where it's photos of body parts that are being taken. Not just body or, parts, but decaying and decaying, very yeah. greasy looking decaying. News stories, or we're hearing news stories about grave robbing and how a body was all set up very artfully. And we actually end up seeing this very artfully set up dead bunch of like corpse pieces in a cemetery can we talk that, about the I, composition of the shot go ahead okay because yeah, with the morning sun coming up was that i believe that was morning sun yeah it, it, yeah they were doing that over the night and then taking yeah. the photos of it yeah. then doing the that, posing I mean, and then taking the photos oh boy i liked it <laughs> the composition of that particular shot and the design that went into to play here now we know who did this later on we we know that for sure but yeah it reveals a certain depth and and um, intelligence in a character that otherwise seems like a silly oaf when we actually meet him. Uh -huh. And the way that that is set up and the way that it's designed, there is actually like the triangular shape. And I think they were doing this for their own personal photography. But I believe that this is hinting that someone that is doing this is into necrophilia and this posing on the gravestone like this is sort of like a snapshot horn for them what Probably, we're seeing yeah. and then they're taking the rest that they want with them wherever they go that's yeah. what i've always assumed they were hinting at here and when we meet the character later on it's not that far of a stretch to believe that that particular character is capable of doing this very ed gein style work who was a huge influence yes. on the texas chainsaw massacre now i'm gonna try and pull back my nerdiness until the 20 minutes from here on out I swear. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, anyway, one of the coolest things about this movie that I love, and I and I think it helps out for me at least, not for anybody else, but for me, um, it always adds to a creepiness factor of any horror movie. It's one of the reasons why I love the original, um, why I love the original Night of the Living Dead so much. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I was into Diary of the Dead when not a lot of people were. Um, the whole opening sequence and the title sequence is the news is still being read. And for some reason, old radio news being read and just silence other than that with just words up on the screen, for some reason, creep me the fuck out. I just love that shit. That is awesome. That's my fetish. It kind of fucking is. <laughs> so, <laughs> Like uh, like Jamie J. Sammons and myself, who are all about the microfiche research to find out about the past. We always love seeing that in a film. Uh, yeah. What this does is give you a time stamp and like a, a snapshot of the troubling times that are, this film is taking place in. Mm -hmm. So With a heat wave. I mean, they're talking about a heat wave. It's yeah, just, people it, dying it, too. If you listen on some of the makes, reports, people are yeah. dying from the heat wave. It's so it bad. It makes you feel it. In the movie, it makes you feel like you're in that movie. It, it takes you into that moment, I guess, to me. Well, it Especially helps too because they're in, in a, front of you. They're in a just words. They're in a sweltering van, and you can see the sweat yeah. pouring off them, and you can see how miserable they are. And then yeah. to hear it talking about the heat wave and how it's only going to get worse, and then they're talking about the things that are happening with the corpses that we just saw at the beginning of the film, anyway, actually happening. So we know that it's yeah. real. And then by the time they get past that point, and the the news reports are over, and they get to where 
they're going that we're about to talk about. This film should have already creeped out someone who's paying even a little bit of attention in some way, shape, or form. They front load this with a ham fisted punch of creepiness yeah. right creepiness to the face. Or at, at the very least, you should just feel uncomfortable. <laughs> uncomfortable. You should not feel comfortable at all right now. Yeah, that's it, not really what happened to me the whole time I watched this opening. Yeah, you're just like getting excited. You're I getting have a giddy. ragey direction. Yeah, basically. <laughs> I have a ragey direction. Basically. Yeah. I gotcha. So anyway, with the title sequence order, we see a van pulls over on the highway. A guy helps out another individual in a wheelchair who must be Franklin, the invalid brother we heard about in the narration. What? More than one person in a film can't be wheelchair bound? They probably could, but I highly doubt that's going to be happening here. <laughs> they don't got the budget for that. I'm just fine. They don't with have you. the budget. They went with a lot of unknowns for this movie. So um, as he they, he get, pushes him out so he can go piss in a coffee can, and right as he's getting ready to go, a semi passes by them very fast, sending him down a hill falling. Um, they What's the over the under into the, the fact that he was peeing as that happened or that made I mean, him pee? That he was definitely, yeah, he was, he was peeing when that happened. <laughs> <laughs> so he's basically rolling around, stewing in his own juices there. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Just having a good time. <laughs> uh, also, kind of interesting that um, it makes it seem like he had something wrong with his legs, but the other parts of him work because he is able yeah. to control his bodily functions to the point where it, he's pissing in a coffee can. Uh, I, I, I suppose that's a thing, right? I mean, it, maybe you just can't walk, but you can maybe control your bladder and such stuff. Well, yeah, you could have like uh, something like some kind of deficiency in the legs that the legs themselves yeah. are not operational or they might be withered or something like that underneath the blue jeans. I mean, it might just be a cheat to have an excuse for him to be coming out of the van. Yeah. You know, I mean, and they also probably couldn't afford whatever, like, you know, colostomy bag or whatever it is that he might yeah. have had to, to, to deal with that way. And it's just easier to show the can. But I'm assuming that Franklin's OK. He's just never had the use of his legs. But the yeah. other parts of him work because uh, yeah, that's otherwise what it you would, seems like. Otherwise, you would see people trying to change his diaper or something along those lines yeah. to help him out. And he's just and he can't stand to piss on the ground. So he pisses in a can and probably just tosses it out. Something along those lines. Yeah, they should have gotten him a high definition piss jug. That's a yeah, reference right? for uh, anyone who loves Trailer Park Boys. Let's get back to okay. the movie. <laughs> um, so back in the van, he's talking about the sweltering heat and how bad it feels. Well, then they go check the graveyard that had been disturbed in the news stories to check on Franklin and his sister's uh, uh, grandfather. The sister goes with a man, uh, the county sheriff, and we see a guy who's kind of drunk on the ground and Franklin's staring at him. And the guy's just talking fuck fucking gibberish but it's fucking again uneasy gibberish it makes you feel real uneasy i disagree that he's speaking gibberish i think what he's doing is speaking the truth to power of something that he's experienced and he's yeah. been incapable of doing anything but drinking himself into okay. a stupor ever since whatever it is it's 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 it, it makes you feel a certain way though <laughs> Right. Well, no, it makes you uncomfortable because he's talking about how like people just look at an old man like him, you know, because he's drunk yep. and they think that he laughs. But there are those that laugh and then those that know and laugh. And what yeah. he's talking about is he knows what's going on. He yeah. knows oh. what's happening. And he is laughing because no one will believe him no matter how much he tries to warn them. That's what I got. Nice. All right. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, well, uh, anyway, we're back in the van and back on the road. And um uh, there's a few discussions here happening. Uh, Sally uh, comforts Franklin, saying that she saw the grandfather's gravesite, didn't look like anything had been disturbed, nothing like that, so he's fine. One of the ladies, Pam, I believe, she's reading an astrology book and reading Franklin's astrology, or, like outlook for his side, is not a very good. He's uh, going to go through something quite horrific, according to her. Yeah, then, Saturn's in retrograde, and yeah. it's one of the main influences for him bunch of horse shit but basically they're just trying to set up more there is malevolence yeah about. yeah it just it's just supposed to set everyone up with some shit <laughs> yeah bad stuff's on the horizon for yeah, everyone yeah. involved as they're driving all of a sudden everyone smells something rancid and franklin deduces that it must be the slaughterhouse right next there and they kind of talk about how they used to slaughter animals with a hammer but then they switched it to a gun uh franklin's uncle apparently works in a slaughterhouse so uh you know it's it's in the the family lineage there i mean well, it's fucking it, texas in the 70s everybody yeah. had a family member that worked at a slaughterhouse somewhere and of course i mean just imagine what that smell must be 
like with that heavy heat, man? Well, <laughs> it's really bad. It has to be really, really bad because yeah. they're in a fucking overclocked, really hot, fucking burning up van. And they all decide to roll up the windows rather than smell that. So it has yeah. to be bad. But it's got to be pretty fucking terrible. So anyway, well, they come by and they see a hitchhiker. And they just, I mean, then, like anybody in the 70s, they stupidly decide to pick him up in our next clip. Well, I think we just picked up Dracula. Where are you headed, man? Sal, you work at that place? Oh, no. How did you get stuck way out here? I, I was at the slaughterhouse. I got an uncle that works at the slaughterhouse. Hey, my, my brother worked there. My my grandfather too. <laughs> my family's always been in me. My whole family of Dracula's. Hey man, did you go in that slaughter room or whatever they call it? The place where they shoot the cattle in the head with that big air gun thing. Oh, that 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 gun's no good. I was in there once with my uncle. No way. With a sledge. <laughs> See, that was better. They died better that way. How come? I, I thought the gun was better. Oh, no. no. With the new way people put out of jobs. You do that? Look. I was the killer. <laughs> Dang. Let me see him. They don't send the heads away. You took these, huh? Yeah. Franklin. See, they make head cheese. They, they take the head and they boil it, except for the tongue. And they scrape all the flesh away from the bone. They, they everything. They don't throw nothing away. They, they use the, the jowls and the muscles and the, and the eyes and the ligaments and everything. And then they look at this. For the nose and the gums and all the flesh, and they boil it down into a, a big jelly of fat. Wow, I, I didn't know that's what was in that stuff. It's really good. You like it? Oh, yeah, sure. I, I like it. Well, it's good. It sounds horrible. If you're comfortable, we can talk about something else. Uh, you'd probably like it if you didn't know what was in it. No, I wouldn't, and I wish you'd stop talking about it. Oh, oh Franklin, you're making everybody sick. Hmm, head cheese. Gonna have mm -hmm. to look into that. That sounds pretty keto. Yeah, man, that, that you'll probably definitely be in ketosis. Um, <laughs> yeah, one of the things I always think about whenever the hitchhikers there, like describing all the stuff that he used to do, and then like how they make the meat process and stuff, and all the things that he's like just really into. Like, yeah, that's how I feel the world sees me when I talk about anything that I like. <laughs> like where everybody's just like tolerating me because they're afraid that at any moment I'm gonna snap and slice them with a razor, <laughs> just like well, this fucker. I just I just had to get this is a hard movie to clip but um i had to get that in there because that guy is just fucking gold so yeah and we need to we, we need to remember this hitchhiker specifically because there's some shit that people have always overlooked in part two that we need to talk about okay the dead guy nubbins that's being carried around in part two is him yeah that's right that's the hitchhiker yeah yeah, yeah. the dead guy being carried around yeah, yeah. and it's I his twin part. brother who is yeah. carrying him around they actually With the metal have the, plate in his head yeah who won't let it heal <laughs> sort of uh but uh the the actor who is playing him bill mosley is yeah. playing shop top that you're talking about he is actually playing the twin brother of this character that's uh that's hilarious but i mean they look just like one another so it makes sense yeah but they're supposed to be twins he's in vietnam during the first movie yeah while all this is happening and he doesn't come back until the second movie that's of course. why i needed to point this out the birthmark is key on that because they're actually on opposite sides they're similar to the the Cobra twins. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> In that aspect, where they're la, almost la, la, la. they're almost like mirror images of each other. So there you go. There you go. Well, uh, the hitchhiker. Then uh, uh, Franklin shows him his the hitchhiker's own pocket knife. The hitchhiker likes it a lot and then proceeds to cut his own hand with it. And everyone starts to get a little freaked out. Then the hitchhiker brings out his knife, which is more like a kind of a blade. Is that court? What would you call that? It's a straight razor. It is a straight, straight razor. Straight, straight razor. razor. Yeah. 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 All right. It's somebody's shaving razor from way, way yeah. back in the day. And uh, so as they're checking it out, uh, he takes a picture of Franklin and he says, hey, now you give me like two bucks. And they're all like no and they give the photo back and he's a little you know unhappy about this so he puts some gunpowder on the picture and lights it so that it kind of goes up a little bit and he laughs and everyone's kind of freaking out then
then he reaches up and he cuts Franklin's arm with his straight razor. Well, at that point, uh, they kick him out of the van and he kind of like rubs blood on the van, but they uh, drive away. Oh, real quick, before right before that, he asked for a ride home, but they're all so freaked out. They're like, oh, we're kind of in a hurry. So we're just going to drop you off here. Yeah, <laughs> as soon as he took out the razor and showed it to him and after he yeah. cut his hand, they're all like looking for excuses to get this crazy fuck right the fuck out of that fucking van. And then, and then he gets kicked out. They drive away. That ends the first 20 minutes. So it sets up for just a lot of creepiness here. Yeah, okay. So the hitchhiker setup that we're talking about here, as they're driving off and he, they run away, he very specifically kicks the van strategically. It looks like yeah. he's supposed to be frenzying, but he's kicking very specific spots and then rubbing blood on it in a certain way. Yeah. And he's making sure that he's scuffing it with his shoes and he's rubbing he mark, blood He's on marking it. it. Yeah, and he's rub- He's actually making somewhat of a weird symbol that I don't really fully recognize. It looks Neither like he was, do I. It looks like he was trying to do like a half moon or, or something or along those lines, but basically it's just these two curving lines that go together, but it's more or less like an X marks the spot. He's he's marking the people like they did for cattle. Yes. They would they would earmark them and they would put like a mark on the mm-hmm. ones that they're, they're about to get slaughtered and then you heard yep. those ones away from the other group and then time for the hook and crook for them. That's what he's doing to the van. Everybody knows the story. Everybody knows where this is going, but he is yeah. marking them and getting them to be separated out of the herd so that they can get taken. Now, people argue that this wouldn't have happened, or I've seen online where they think that maybe if he, they would have paid for the pitcher, he would have let them go. But I don't think yeah. that's the case. I don't think so at all. No, they I picked think... him up and he tried to coax them into the house. And I think then... if he he would he was trying to coax them just to get a ride home. So Yeah, but I think, I think he was actually they bought the picture he'd be like can i get a ride home now (laughs) yeah well he would have gotten the ride home or he would have tried to get the ride home specifically to get them to take him to the house so that they could then slaughter them all and and eat them too yeah you see what i'm saying like a lot of people think that the 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 marking thing wouldn't have happened if they would have bought that but he would have still marked it or he would have talked them into driving him and if they would have drove him back then they would have just hastened all their demises even sooner oh yeah nope totally agreed so it's all bad it's all bad Nothing but, good. But this introduction here, by the time the actual hitchhiker is there and everybody is trying to deal with that hitchhiker in the van, by the time they get him kicked out and he marks the van and is kicking the hell out of the van and then does like a little bit of a crazy dance at them, by the time that all takes place, just about everybody else on the fucking planet would not do what they decide to do when that place doesn't have gas. Yeah. <laughs> they, they would not decide to stop at an old dilapidated house. And <laughs> no. then... No, it's it's and and we're going to get there, obviously, but they don't get one harbinger. They don't get two harbingers. They get three harbingers before they go where they're going. Yeah. Because if they would have listened to the drunk old fucking crazy bastard at the cemetery, he's the first one. He knows what's going on, whether he knows about the chainsaw massacring or not. But he knows what happened at that cemetery. He was probably there drinking and watched it happen. Yeah. At the very least. Or maybe he's just a long lost family member that just doesn't participate in what they're doing because he just lays around at the cemetery getting drunk all day. Something. But somebody knows some shit. Well, the, so, well, the hitchhiker's supposed to be there to snag him. He's the second harbinger because after their interaction with him, they shouldn't really be stopping anywhere because yeah. he could come find them again if they're pulled over for long enough. You just, you just drive, man. You just try to get the fuck out of here. But yeah, that's, they run into some issues because we start our next 20 minutes and they stop at a barbecue slash gas station joint to get some gas. The guy comes out and says, we don't have any gas. His tanks are empty and the guy's not going to be here to refill them till this evening or possibly even tomorrow. Franklin asks him where the old, uh, their family old homestead, if he knows where that is. He says, yeah, it's an old, he goes, you guys don't want to go there. That's an old dilapidated house. He goes, you don't, you don't always don't want to take your girls up there. It's just not good. And he's like, oh, well, it's, you know, it's it's my family's. And he goes, I gotcha. He goes, you know, can, why don't you guys come in and get barbecue instead? So they get barbecue, but they decide to leave anyway. And they notice the blood on the van that it's kind of a symbols on it. So even they're starting to be like creeped out by the van, but you know, the guy, it's weird. This is weird that this guy was like, uh, you know, now that we know what's going on in this movie, he tried to discourage them from going to that place. Well, he might more or less be the one who does the quality control of, oh, yeah. of the beefs well, being be selected, is my guess. And maybe he decided that maybe they aren't exactly worth it. Yeah, that could be. Because the people know where they are or whatever. Yeah. I also want to point out, he does specifically say to them, you don't want to go messing around that old house. You yeah. don't want to go poking into houses that look a 
abandoned because there are people that, you know, will defend their home and they will take a, offense to that. He does he, he does warn them, don't go poking around those old houses. And they're like, he well, also we doesn't have them. any gas, though, so it could also be, you know, where he knows they'll run out. You know, <laughs> well, yeah, that could be too. Maybe they'll get lost along the highway and then someone can come and get them. That's in yeah. the family that works with them. He might be trying to set it up that way too. But also given the close proximity to what we see happens later on in the film for these two houses that are involved in the story. Yeah. Maybe he just doesn't want them poking around because what if uh, the hitchhiker or whoever else might be involved is there at the time? Cause he doesn't know what his family's doing while he's at work. That's true. He doesn't. Yeah. I mean, we're kind of burying the lead here, but we don't. Well, <laughs> right. Nobody really yeah. knows. But at the same time, you know, like th- the multiple reasons why he's sending them on like he does, you know, it could be just multiple things. But uh, are they even out of gas or is he just telling everybody that to let other other people run out of gas so they can harvest more of them? Yeah, that's true. Well, so anyway, they're back in the car and Franklin keeps wondering if uh, that guy was uh, trying to scare him. Uh, just like if he's just scaring him or if he was really messed up. The hitchhiker? Yeah. Okay. Uh, they get to the old house and they check out the blood symbol and all that. And then uh, the four, well, able-bodied teens, I guess, they decide to go check out the house while leaving poor Franklin kind of stuck and hard to get around. Oh, Franklin's- we got to back up while they're checking out the blood oh. on the van. Okay, go ahead. Um, They were eating sausages in the van. Yes. And Franklin is sitting they there. Because they bought barbecue. Yeah. Franklin is staring at yeah. that blood stain with a, a sausage, sausage hanging out of his, his mouth. mouth. That's a human dick. Yep, probably. No, that is a human dick. That well, is we what don't that's know supp- if it was a human dick. No, that no. could just be grounded up human meat into a sausage case. That's supposed to be a human dick. It's in the fucking commentary. Oh, really? Gun- Gunner oh, Hansen- holy shit. Gunnar Hansen flat out asks Toby Hooper. Toby Hooper kind of chuckles and goes, oh, so it was a dick. It was yeah, supposed oh. to be a dick. I mean, yes, it's just a sausage, and it could be human guts stuffed with human ground up meat. Yeah. But in this case, it's a sausage that they just made out of a tube of meat that already exists. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Good times. <laughs> or they use the skin casing for that. But that's, yeah, that, like they just, it's it's very heavily inferred in that commentary that that's absolutely the case between yeah. the two of them. So yeah, it's a dick. Good times for everyone involved. <laughs> and I just also want to point out they were trying to get a PG or G rating with this. Are you kidding me? No, well, that we'll go into that more at the final thoughts. But yeah, while they're doing all of this stuff in the movie, all of the, the dark fucking humor that they have yeah. buried in this movie, the end goal was shooting for a G rating for general audience and we'll get into as to why but that's what they were trying to do that's why there's that's, like hardly uh, any blood stuff. at all there's like no blood at that's all that's true there really blood. isn't any blood in this there's like one scene where there's actually like blood flying yeah I just always thought that was because of um, uh, just money constraints. No, we'll, we'll get into that as well. So I'll, I'll save that for like the final thoughts section too, if okay. if I can remember. So let's just keep going. Otherwise, we'll be right. here all night talking about how amazing this yeah. movie is. Right, of course. So then um, Kirk and Pam, they decide they're going to head for a swimming hole Franklin is talking about. Franklin tells them where to go. And as they leave, Franklin finds like a lot of bones and almost bone chimes being hung up in the house. And he calls out for Sally because that seems a little fucking weird. Then we cut to Kirk and Pam. They are uh, heading down the swimming hole and they see another house and Kirk believes they have gas. He almost can hear like something running. So they get up to the house and they find a generator that's running and a lot of cars. Kirk's under the belief he could leave them a couple bucks, his guitar. They could get gas, leave. And when they're on the way back, he'll pick up their guitar, his his guitar and give them some more money. Uh, Well, anyway, uh, as they're kind of just right around like the front door, Kirk um, finds like a tooth and he freaks uh, 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 he freaks Pam out with it so she sits on a bench that's in the yard. Well Kirk knocks on the front door and it opens. Goes inside and down a hallway he sees a wall of animal skulls. Um, and he keeps hearing what sounds like a pig. Uh, as he walks up to the room Leatherface appears right away out of nowhere. It's one of the best introductions. There's no slow build. He's just there and then he hammers Kirk to death. The first strike sends Kirk into convulsions it's a cool kind of kill um because he's just kind of shaking and stuff so i don't know why but that just seemed realistic and cool uh, i can tell you exactly why he shake was shaking like that and what they were uh-huh. trying to replicate oh yeah yeah when you strike an animal in the brain pan like that and you send shards into their brain that ultimately kill them at the same time yeah. it also sends a lightning storm of panic and um just nerve endings trying to figure out what the fuck is going on and it causes convulsions
happens like that huh. until that's done until like the body stops moving you know yeah. it doesn't have the power anymore but yeah Damn. he's dead one shot to the head he was fucking dead he's yeah. just he's, he's just twitching because the shards the bone shards in his brain are making all the synapses fire in his brain and are just sending pulses all over his body yeah that's what happens with that type of death <laughs> Well, I mean, either way, that was pretty cool. Oh, it's grotesque and it's yeah. realistic. And the worst part it, of it is he just drags him like he's his own hook and crook crew. Yeah. Slamming the door much. and everything. And it's horrifying. That whole sequence knocks you on your ass every fucking time you watch it. Oh, yeah. Big time. Big time time then pam starts to get a little worried so she kind of goes and she investigates the house she comes into a room and falls in it in some room just full of human bones and other animal bones but you can see a human skull bones and the smell must be horrendous Uh, Um, there's also chicken feathers everywhere because this is the room where they pluck all the chickens that they eat yep well, uh, Leatherface finds her, picks her up, carries her into the room, and hooks her alive. Puts her on a ho- meat hook alive. And then as she sits there screaming and screaming, and as she looks, Leatherface then chainsaws Kirk, cutting him up. And that ends that 20 minutes. So that's... Woo! All right, so at this break here, I want to talk about... There's this, another shot that is the cinematography, and this is so fucking gorgeous. And they took the time, and they really, really spent the time to make this happen so beautifully and i wanted to discuss it so the sequence where she's sitting on that swing that's built out of the railroad ties like they have the railroad yeah. ties for the, the the like it's sort of like a porch swing on hanging from railroad ties that type of bench mm-hmm. um she's on that swing and kirk gets hit falls down and gets dragged off and then she sits there for a second and then calls for him but then she stands up the camera goes underneath the bench that's swinging or that that swing and follows her from underneath and it's focused on the middle of her back and her ass for a little bit of exploitation for that shot of course yeah but what they're doing there is they are putting her dead center in frame the middle of her back and how naked and helpless it is there's nothing there to protect her at all because the type of top that she's wearing goes across her neck and around her waist and then covers the front of her but it leaves the back all open which given this type of weather this would probably be a very comfortable thing Thing to wear because the heat just comes right off of you. <laughs> There's yeah, not right? much helping retain that heat. But by showing how vulnerable her back is and how open it all is, and then also giving you a little bit of the titillation if her particular body shape is the thing that you're into, which yeah. I am, it, it <laughs> activates multiple levels in your brain at once watching that. Because at first you're like, oh yeah. And then you kind of think about it and she's going into the house and you're like, oh no. Oh no. <laughs> and then that beautiful back that you're so fixated on and looking at the curvature and all of the yeah. musculature and maybe kind of lusting after if you're inclined to do that sort of thing, which I am. <laughs> it then subverts that by having this monster of Leatherface break out of the room after she falls down, pick her up and throw that back on a hook and just leave her there because that's the easiest way for him to deal with her later. Yeah. And then he proceeds to chainsaw her boyfriend's fucking head off in front of her. Yeah, pretty much. That's right. Yeah. (laughs) So you go from this, you go through these multiple levels, like you see the shock and the fear whenever she's in there, and we know all along she should not be going into that house. But there's still a part of our brain, and by ours, I mean me, specifically, that is watching her naked back and her ass as she's walking there and thinking about her in that aspect aspect where I'm kind of less than after or a little better, just kind of like, yeah. And then I realize I'm no better than the fucking cannibal that looks at that and goes prime beef and yeah, hangs right. her on a fucking hook. Like, except for it's not, they're not using very good stock. All these, I mean, except for Franklin, all these are very scrawny little kids, man. They're just, it's not going to make good barbecue. There's no way you're going to get any flavor out of that. It's going to be tough as shit. <laughs> I think they would have made them into beef jerky, my dude. It it had to have been. I mean, there's no way you're going to get any decent, like, nothing, nothing good out of that. I mean, the ribs would probably just be almost non-existent. So I'm just saying. (laughs) There's no fat cap up on that one. Yeah, no fat cap, no flavor. That's all I'm saying. Dried up meat. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you have a good point. I cannot argue your barbecue technique <laughs> critique. Well, particularly poor Pam, who got thrown on a hook. I mean, that meat is definitely fucking ruined. One of the techniques that I have to complain about here is she should have been put down humanely before he put her on the hook because all of the adrenaline, all of the fear and everything, he's ruining her flavor. Yeah. That's bad. 
<laughs> just saying maybe maybe that's the kind of flavor they're into maybe they like that but if you have an animal die and be like shock and fear and terror with adrenaline going like that it does tend to make the meat like not be good just yeah. pure and simple you you got to make them not suffer when they go <laughs> <laughs> if you know what you're doing so true enough yeah true enough also chainsaws for butchery is not a thing yeah that's so not a thing you can't do that that's not a thing it's not it's so not a thing you're right <laughs> not a thing not a thing at all all right i'm not done with my, i'm done with my 20 minute break i got everything out i needed to say right. from there so the next 20 minutes starts with jerry pam and franklin they're checking up the van um franklin's freaking out about the hitchhiker jerry's pretty much being a douchebag all this leads into our I'm next clip you. you don't think it means anything we'll protect you if he tries to get you well, i bet it's about me he's gonna kill you franklin it probably doesn't mean anything huh you worry too much well he couldn't find us anyway i mean he doesn't even know our names i gave him your name franklin i told him where you live i even gave him your zip code he's gonna kill you jerry what are you doing I can't find my knife. That knife will do you any good. He likes that knife, remember? When did you have it last? Well, I didn't have it last. You had it last. I gave it to you, remember? What'd you do with it? Well, I don't know. Didn't I give it back to you? No, I didn't have it when I got out of the van. You just never gave it back to me. All right, I'll look for it. Listen, I think I'll walk down to the creek before it gets too dark. How do I get there, Frank? Well, there's a trail down there in between them two old sheds. Can I go, too? Uh, I think you better stay here. All right. I can't find it. Are you mad at me? No, I'm not mad at you. You really are mad, huh? Oh, I, I don't blame you. I'm, you really didn't want me to come did you? Oh, Franklin, I'm just tired. It's been a long day. Sally, did you believe in all that stuff that Pam was telling about Saturn and retrograde and all that? I don't know. Everything means something, I guess. You don't think that guy try and follow us, do you? Well, I mean, there's no way that he could follow us. He's probably afraid Kirk will kill him. Sally? What now? Nothing. Never mind. The heat, the worry, Franklin being annoying, Jerry being a douche. I normally hate Franklin, but this time around watching it, I had some sympathy for him. I, I had sympathy, but he also, man, you need to shut up, like, two seconds <laughs> <laughs> well he's just scared i mean the guy cut his arm yeah. and he's terrified the guy's gonna come for him and when he's asking for some kind of comfort in the best way that he possibly can everybody's just irritated they're tired and it's fucking hot as shit so he's just irritating everybody and when we're watching it like the way that he used to get really mad and blow the the raspberries and everything that used to really piss me off and irritate me and i just hated him but now that i think about it like he's in a fucking wheelchair and they're off goofing off having a good old time and why the right? hell is he even there you know what yeah, I mean? the scene in the house when he gets stuck down there i feel bad for him because it's like you people got to be fucking nicer right but i and used to he fucking even, hate he even him. says he even says he goes and it's weird in the movie you get two different stories because uh, at that point he's like you should come along franklin it'll be nice franklin you'll have fun franklin you know doing the you know mocking them and then this time he's like asking his sister you know you didn't really want me to come along did you just because of the way she's acting now but she may have asked him but maybe she wanted him to say no yeah that's true and maybe she was just being nice but he said yes and that's why it's you know he's being such a drag maybe yeah. sally's parents wouldn't let them go without franklin being there yeah that's true Could maybe be. maybe they think that franklin's gonna be some kind of like you know protector of her virtue or whatever bullshit or you know just whatever you know whatever kind of fucking you know they can't get in this too much trouble because franklin they all have to look after him so or maybe they're looking at it like you know franklin Franklin's a fucking drag. They don't want him around either. Let's saddle Sally with him and ruin her fucking trip. And then at least we get a couple days without having to deal with him whining. 
That could also be true, because Franklin's a bit of a whiner. I mean, he kind of has every right to be, and I have way more sympathy for him now than what I used to, but I'm so used to being so filled with vitriol and hate for him. It's because you're getting older. It's getting getting older, my friend. You're getting softer. (laughs) I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Maybe it's because watching it this time around, I realized on any kind of trip, I am Franklin. (laughs) Well, you're not, you know, because no one has to take care of you. At this point, Jerry goes looking and he finds this house. As he's on the deck, he sees the blanket that the couple had taken. So he knows they were there. As he walks in, he finds the slaughter room. He can hear noises coming from the freezer. When he opens it, Pam, pop, her eyes open. She pops out, mumbling and screaming, probably because she's all fucked up. Uh, At this point, Leverface shows up again, kills Jerry by hammering in his skull, puts Pam right back in the freezer and locks it. Then he sort of has a little paper clips moment where he's rummaging around until he finally sits down in the window and contemplates life. And we get our first real good look of the Leatherface character. And creepy. Oh, I I actually grabbed a clip of the noises he was making while he was freaking out. excellent. Who in the fuck? took my paper clips it's powerful creepy stuff man powerful creepy stuff yeah Good. yeah it's very yeah. moving makes me very uncomfortable <laughs> uh i think what's happening here is um it's heavily implied in this film that leatherface is not all there yeah but like besides the fact that he's a cannibal i think it's heavily implied that he is developmentally challenged yes. and may have a facial deformity and that's why he always wears other people's faces mm-hmm. um given by how his teeth look underneath the the current mask that he's wearing very much so I feel like that's the case with the facial deformity. Um, It's plausible to believe that he has possibly some kind of downs on top of something else that uh, that that may be causing what it is, because he's really kind of nonverbal. They make it to where he can make noises like and he He only makes noises, but he does not talk. No. And the only time he comes close to talking is making noises that sound like words that he's mimicking when he talks to a family member later on. Uh, I I want to talk about the the cinematography and the scene when he sits down and they go in close on the face where yeah. he's wearing that skin mask. There are moments when Gunnar Hansen, the actor, the way that his eyes are darting around and looking, it just mm-hmm. says to me, like he's going, where are they all coming from? Why are yeah. they coming into my house? What, what is going on? Who are these people? Jesus Christ. Right. He's, he's like, why is all this beef walking into my house? It's essentially I like mean, he's, he's like, he's scared. Like, when, where are they going to come from? You know, I'm all here alone. How do I keep dealing with this? I'm out of freezer space. Yeah, right. I <laughs> The meat's going to go bad. Right. Dad's going to be pretty pissed about this. Right. I, I feel like that's what's going on in his eyes because he's looking around and he's like, like he looks terrified. He looks like he's it, horrified. Or it's almost all, like it, all the people are walking in. Yeah. I almost didn't know terrified, but when he's sitting there in the close up of his face, it almost looks like exhausted. Like a guy who just got done with his shift at work, just sat down and went, whoo, it's a busy day today. Well, it's, oh man! I think it's a little bit of both, but like I got the uh, benefit of I watched this on my projector and the screen was huge, ha, huge. And that shot of him, I was really able to look at Gunnar Hansen's eyes and the way that he's motioning his eyes around and the way that he touches his face and everything. And that was just the impression that I got. He's clearly uh-huh. exhausted because he yeah. just he just murdered and butchered two, maybe three people. Yeah, and he's got one in the freezer to have to do later, and he's still got to make dinner for the family when they come home. Like he's yeah, got to be exhausted. Oh no, no. No, no, no. He's not the cook. He's just the butcher. <laughs> uh, well, in this movie, I disagree, but we'll we'll get back to that once right. once that scene comes into play. Okay. It's now night, and I love how they shot this. Sometimes I love this with lower budget, especially horror movies, when it's night and you get that feeling of pitch darkness, and you don't get to, you know, the, the, a lot of times light is ju- nighttime is just a heavy blue light on everybody to pretend like it's moonlight, you know. <laughs> Well, in this so, movie, I think they actually shot at night and they used what lights that they had. And it's just like a pitch black, barren wasteland. And you yeah, only get glimpses of stuff. And it think, I think it works to their it just benefit. More, I know. It's just more authentic. Where oh, in a lot terrifying. of other mo- Yeah. Yeah. Where in another lot of movies, you get like this giant blue light that's supposed to be moonlight. I often think of like Basket Case when I was watching that. And it was all these night scenes. And it was like, it's not really nighttime. It's it, the whole room's lit up in this bathing blue light. Not even a full moon will do that. So, Well, in Basket Case, the first one, a lot of that takes place in the inner city, which would have blue lights bathing places here and there. I suppose. But I get anyway, your point. this just I creeps get, me out. I get your point. You yeah. don't like day for night shooting. You prefer... 
prefer just shoot in the black and show me what you can show. What, exactly. What they use to their advantage in this sequence is whenever they're going past brambles and all of those other things that are like the brush and all the stuff that's going to fuck you up and rip you up and get in your way when you're trying to push your, you know, cousin around mm-hmm. <laughs> or, or brother, brother. Uh, around in a wheelchair. Uh, the way that they come at the camera and the way that they actually run the camera at these things while they're lit, it makes it look like, and they cut into it real fast, it makes it look like just all of a sudden you can see that out of your corner of your eye walking in the pitch black and you duck right before you get fucked up again. Like they yeah. did a really good job of simulating what it feels like trying to maneuver through that kind of horrific overgrowth really well. Yeah, I uh I particularly yeah, it was just a uh, just some great stuff there. Um so as they are kind of Franklin and Sally are arguing at the car, she wants to go looking for him. He wants her to stay there, and they, they'll they'll honk a little bit more. And if the honking doesn't work, they'll drive up to that gas station and see if they ended up there. But then they realize Jerry had the keys to the car, so now Franklin's really flipping out. Sally says she wants the flashlight. Give it to her. She's going to go look in. Franklin's like, just hold on. Just hold on, because he doesn't want to be left behind. And then they freak out. They fight over the light flashlight, and he says, just, I'll go with you. I'll go with you. So she's having to push him along. As she Then she says she's just going to go without the flashlight and he's like hold on so he's trying to follow her so at one point they're in the they're kind of just going down they see the house so they're heading up to there to see if the 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 group's up there and she's pushing while franklin holds the flashlight um he's trying to help her wheel too because he's got the flashlight like under an arm pointing yeah. forward and he's trying to wheel while she pushes but this is just dumb what yeah. they're doing here is like they're screaming they got a light on that you can be seen from far far away yeah and they're just drawing all sorts of attention to themselves pretty much so at this point leatherface pops out and in really cool scene uh is killing franklin with the chainsaw but the flashlight is moving as franklin's arms fail uh and so it's really fucking creepy really well done really gives you a jump scare i knew it was coming and i still i still got the jump scares <laughs> i've watched this film more times than i can count on multiple fucking formats yeah. i jump every goddamn time because the chainsaw loudness kicks in on the soundtrack and yeah. the chainsaw just fires up and the next thing you know franklin's being hamburgered and this sequence where franklin's being killed is the only time any blood gets splattered yeah it's, well it's, you see a little bit you, of blood when uh kurt gets fucked and flailed but or not flailed but when he gets hammered in the head uh, yeah but that's the thing man the blood that not you, a lot the blood yeah. no but the blood that you actually see a lot of it's already on the wall if you pay attention yeah so when they hang her on a hook there's already blood splattered on the wall behind so your brain automatically fills in the blanks there's no actual blood spray other yeah, than that's true there's no actual blood spray other than right there when franklin's getting chainsawed and it's just a tiny bit it's it's literally i think it's toby hooper but it's literally somebody with a cup of blood putting it in their mouth and spitting it at Gunnar Hansen to get that effect. Yeah. So, um, then, uh, Sally runs, of course, um, and we get a chase scene through the wood, kind of like the woods. I mean, not really woods, but just the fields. The overgrowth, the bramble. The overgrowth. Yeah. Um, Sally runs up into the house. She goes upstairs and she finds one com- almost completely decomposed body, another one very, very grody looking body sitting in chairs upstairs. Just then, uh, Leatherface starts chainsawing through the door. Uh, so she freaks out and as he, she goes downstairs, he gets to the door. She runs back upstairs and jumps out a window and falls to the ground and she's able to get up and escape. She runs back to the barbecue shack. And the dude there says he doesn't have a phone. She's not making a lot of sense, but she needs a phone. He says, hold on. We'll go to the sheriff's place. Let me grab my truck. Well, she's sitting there in there and she's watching, like looking at all the barbecue cooking and everything, which, you know, that's not a bad technique. The way he was cooking barbecue. It's, it was the, the way he had the meat hanging and everything it looks great. Uh, I don't know why he's cooking that late. That food looks like it's going to be ready to serve in about, uh, I don't know, probably about another uh, hour or two. So I don't know why he had that cooking, but I think whatever. he's coming back. I think he set that up to go do dinner with the fam and he was expecting to be back working on the meat. I I think that's what it is because it looks like it's just freshly popped in there too from the... I don't know. Some of that looked ready to go almost. (laughs) Especially the sausages hanging. (laughs) Well, he may be smoking some of it to the point of full dehydration and maybe he's going to be making jerky that he lays off later. That could be. Yeah. That's that's a distinct possibility. But that smoke setup that they have there is gorgeous. It's a perfect little amount for that restaurant that they have there. Yeah, it's a nice little pit. Yeah, it's really nice. Um, so then he gets out of the truck and she knows he has a bag and rope. 
Well, after they struggle for a bit, he grabs a broom and starts swapping her. Uh, she had a knife, and he swapped that out of her hands. And he kind of hits her uh, and gets her tied up and drags her out to the truck and throws her on the floor bed of the truck. And that ends that 20 minutes before we head into our final and kind of exciting 20 minutes of this movie. And not that the rest of this movie hasn't been exciting, but, you know. <laughs> what I find the most interesting about this is they do a little twist with their final harbinger. Usually yeah. before when a, like a, well, even this is like kind of predates slasher films, this movie, obviously. But when you see this in like a slasher film or when someone goes to a cabin that they're about to end up possessed or some shit like that or something like that's going to happen. Someone at some point warns them and tells them that they should go away. There's always some kind of a horror yeah. movie harbinger. Like, you don't want to go playing around on that there mountain, you know? Yeah. Bad don't stuff want to go happening. down that road. Yeah, there's always some kind of a warning tale that, like, the heroes have to ignore, or the, the protagonists, I should say, have to ignore. And in this case, like I said, they get three of them in this film. Yeah. Which really kind of drives the point home. The first one, I would not fault anyone who hasn't watched the film more than 15 times to really pay attention and notice what that guy's saying and think that maybe he's a harbinger. And I'll accept yeah. arguments otherwise if people don't believe that that's just that's yeah. just how i've interpreted it but the hitchhiker should have been a really good fucking warning that they should have gone somewhere you know and done something about that and reported that guy you know something they they should have basically but they also made a bad decision with the gas and then when the guy with the gas station said that they might today maybe tomorrow but they don't have any gas yeah they, and you know i don't think they asked about the phone or maybe they asked about the phone but their decision just to go up the road a piece and stay in that abandoned house until the next day to try and get gas so they can keep going. I mean, that could be argued that they had no other choice, but like the minute they go walking around and walking into an abandoned looking house that has a bunch of abandoned looking cars that are covered over the top of them so that aerial views just, it looks like brush yeah, and nothing else. There are all sorts of warning signs with the two of them walking up to that place. Like I've seen like farms that have tons of cars just parked in there and they're just set out to rust or they're just going to be used for parts. But the farmer doesn't usually have a fear about whether or not it can be seen from an aerial view exactly so if someone were out searching for people you wouldn't want a vehicle to be noticed now on your property that's why it's covered that should have been a huge warning sign to him that the, they should just turn around and leave i wonder if they would have had them come for them in the house if they would have stayed there and that would have been a different movie or it could have been a different route of going about and telling the story but the way to yeah. dispatch the kids one by one like that is brilliant because they just go wandering in where they shouldn't go wandering in because they think they're going to be okay because it's Southern hospitality, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And I love the idea that they're, they're working as a team. There's a hitchhiker who tries to get them into the house. And then if that doesn't work, they're going to probably pull over at the gas station to say what happened if the hitchhiker gets kicked out of the car. The guy's going to tell him that he's going to deal with it. And he can fake a phone call to the police if he wants to, the, the barbecue cook. Yeah. Right. And then they can just wait there for the police to come. And then like when the coast is clear, he can kill them. Though he says he doesn't do that. He could have the hitchhiker show up and kill him or you yep. know like he could just invite him back to his place for dinner and then there'll be dinner at his place like they have a three-prong attack Pretty much, yeah. Along this highway, in at least two prongs. You know, they they have the gas station, and then they have the uh, they, they have the the hitchhiker going up and down the highway. And I just kind of feel like there's always going to be more to this family than these three. And it's always hinted at very heavily that like it's a big family doing this. It just so happens that we only see the three in this house. Yeah, like you just always uh, get that sensation because they're keeping their grandmother and grandfather and they they're corpses because they refuse to accept the fact that. They're, they're dead, or as far as we know, they're dead in this case. I'm not even 100% sure by part two that grandma's dead, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Um, well, anyway, here we go. Final 20. Yeah, let's finish her off. Where we get into this now. Um, so, uh, driving back, he keeps, like, whacking her, and she's, like, crying. He's like, ah, don't cry. And, like, he's just being a real dick. That's psychotic. Like, he is poking yeah. her with a with a, the broken broom handle, like, with it, the broken it, part of the broom, causing her torment and pain and telling her everything's going to be okay and it'll be fine, while proving yeah. the opposite with his psychotic ways and laughing about it. Like, he plays sadistic and fucking rotten and evil so far fucking well he really does jim yeah. sideout is an amazing fucking actor and th yeah this film he, would not be the same without him 
He bo- No, it would not. He both does very sadistic actions while his words are very calming. <laughs> and it's really, really, really fucking terrifying to sit and yeah. watch him in this scene when he's doing that. Because he takes a real sadistic glee where you're like, oh, yeah, he's just making excuses that he doesn't like to do the killing. Look at him. He likes he's, it. He's having fun here. <laughs> yeah, he likes to have them suffer and beg for help before something happens. That's That's his bag. Yeah. And that's why he's so glad to have young Sally here. Yeah, there's definitely something wrong with him. So then he sees the hitchhiker. He pulls over, starts yelling at him for being an idiot and being stupid for messing with all those graves and almost getting caught and also leaving his brother alone. He slaps him around a bit. Well, they drive back then. They get to the house and he sees the doors all cut up and he's mad about that. And he Look tells what the, your brother did to the door. Yeah, exactly. Then he tells his uh, he tells the hitchhiker to get Sally, uh, get the girl upstairs and tie her up. Um, so they uh, fi- he finds Leatherface now dressed as a woman and starts admonishing him for probably letting all the kids go and for you know you probably all the kids got let go all that kind of stuff and he says no you know or Leatherface doesn't say anything but he makes motions that they're all in the freezer all cut up well and, and if you, you, if you listen he's actually saying words but he's trying to make them as like a noise where he's like ah in here yeah like he kind of says yeah, some yeah. words but they're supposed to be like noises I'm glad that you noticed that it's a matronly actually kind of grandmotherly face and wig that he's wearing yep with the bib that he has on too this is Leatherface in his domestic life mode and yes. he's actually working on cooking and cleaning and he's prepping the dinner for the family that's yeah. what i was getting at well he's prepping the the he's prepping the yeah he's setting the table and all that kind of stuff yeah he's doing the domestic bliss stuff so he has a face yep. for when he does the the factory work and slaughter work kind of thing and then he has this face for when he's doing the you know like house work or, or what have yeah. you, where he's trying to be more matronly and everything. It's really interesting depth of character that they came up with because they had to build the faces and the wigs to pull this off. So clearly they thought about what they were doing to have him be like this. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of, a lot of fun, fun stuff here is uh, happening. So um, uh, let's see here. Then he's still, he's like, oh, okay, well, you did all that. And then he still gets pissed off about the door. Then we see the hitchhiker ties the girl uh, to a human chair, is the best way to put it. Like, the <laughs> arms are actual arms. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so then uh, the hitchhiker and Leatherface, um, they uh, grab one of the bodies upstairs, being the grandfather, and apparently he is still very much alive, and they get him set up uh, for dinner. Uh, then they uh, they uh, bring the girl down to Grandpa. Uh, they cut her finger, and he starts drinking the blood. Uh, and she passes out. She then wakes up to Leatherface now in a full suit, wearing, I believe, her brother's face. Yes, he is very much wearing Franklin's face. Yes. And hair. And uh, they torture her a little bit more, but not not physically, but they're all just kind of mentally torturing her right now. But then they start arguing amongst themselves. This barbecue dude, he just, he says, you know, I don't kill. I just cook. You guys have to do this. He goes, but, you know, let's let's be good. And this actually leads to our final clip. No need to torture the poor girl. You just shut up. Remember, you're just a cook. And me and him will handle this. Get on with it. I won't have this. <laughs> we ain't in no hurry. You ain't going no place. No. <laughs> you hear me? I heard you, but it don't mean much. No sense in waiting. I got open up. I've been, I've been thinking about letting Grandpa have some fun. You always said he's the best. He's the best, all right. Just let him have a whack. Hey, Grandpa, we gonna let you have it. So they bring the young lady over. Uh, and they give, they put the hammer in Grandpa's hands, but he's so old and almost, you know, dying that he keeps dropping the hammer and they have her head in like a bucket because, you know, that's how he's supposed to kill her. Um, and he, they keep trying, he keeps dropping it and she's able to break three as, cause they're all trying to help Grandpa and she jumps out of another window. Well, by this point, it's becoming morning time. Uh, she is scared. Um, 
and she just runs with uh, the hitchhiker in close pursuit and Leatherface backing him up with the chainsaw. He's also she, slashing her back like a shit ton, which yes, is slowing a shit her ton down with his knife. Yes, because yeah. he's playing with her and her knees are not working after the second time she jumped out a window. She's all slashed up before they even get to her. She got hit in the head with a hammer like two, three times. The guy might not have been that strong, but there was a couple that really rang her bell. Like, yeah, like she may not live through this is what I'm getting at. Yes. Um, she is pretty much just covered in blood at this point. Um, as she runs, she, uh, semi, uh, is running and she's able to get, she's trying to flee him down, but she has to get out of the way because it can't stop in time. Well, uh, Hitchhiker doesn't notice that and he gets ran the fuck over by a fucking semi. And he is what we would call in the medical profession, very dead. Most sincerely dead. Yeah. That motherfucker is a pancake. So, with all of that, uh, Leatherface, however, is still quite a problem, and he is still after her. The guy, the semi-truck driver gets out, he gets her, well, he doesn't get out, but he gets her into the car, uh, it, but unfortunately, Leatherface is now chainsawing at the door, so they both go at the passenger side door. Leatherface gives chase. Our trucker friend takes out, he had grabbed a wrench from the truck. He throws it, hitting Leatherface in the head, falls, chainsawing his own leg, which was a really cool effect. Uh, Just a little point. There's a metal plate across his leg. There's actual meat between the jeans and the metal plate. And they yeah. let a live chainsaw run and pull the meat out like it should and hope for the best for it not to drift too far on the metal plate. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's... Uh, that's insane. They, that's we'll, we'll, really insane. We're almost to the close, so I'm going to say, the rest of my my stuff to talk about how insane this shoot got but that alone i had to talk about because that is completely insane it, it, it really fucking is insane. So they run again. Uh, a pickup truck comes down, and she's able to flake that guy. All the while, the semi-truck driver just keeps running. He's fucking gone. Um, She is able to get into the truck as Leatherface, right before he gets after her. There's a lot of hold-your-breath moments in this part. She's able to get into the back. The truck driver takes, or the pickup truck driver takes off. She's covered in blood, screaming, laughing, going pretty much insane, which one would through these type of things um and at the very end uh we see leatherface in the morning sun dancing whipping his chainsaw around in anger roll credits All right, this might take a little bit. You go, because I did the notes. <laughs> go, Court, you right. go. All right, there sequence that she is being kidnapped in um, when she's actually at the dinner is the main thing that I want to focus on, but I'm going to back up to the part where she goes running um, out of the house and around through the brambles and everything. Okay. Um, I don't know who went through that window. I'm not sure if Marilyn Burns did her own stunt or not. I don't think she did. I'm not 100% sure, but Marilyn Burns sacrificed her physical health for this role. There was so oh, yeah. much damage done to her to do oh. this. When she goes running through the woods, there's a lot of really comedic moments where they're doing like a cat and mouse cartoon thing where he keeps popping up. And to yeah. me, it's hilarious because it's like Droopy always showing up and being like, you know, catching the guy that's trying to run away when he's the Mountie or whatever. Like that's how yeah. that's how they're playing that. Like it is comedy. It's just that because he wants to kill her, it's dark comedy. He even, yeah, does, a, yeah. he even does a Keystone cop skit around the corner when Whenever she goes running into the into the shop, but because she's going into the gas station, Leatherface just stops and and walks away. Right, so that Keystone Cops kid also makes me laugh every fucking time. But I'm still terrified for her. But like it's like a nervous laughter where I'm like, eh, he's probably not that scary. <laughs> You know, um, please don't be that scary. Uh, all right. The sacrifice of Marilyn's body. Uh, when she goes running in to the gas station for help and she's like in that barbecue pit area, that's a cement floor. She throws herself on the cement floor every time that physical drop that she does. She did without any padding every yeah. time. I don't know if it was because she didn't know any better or because she needed it to be super dramatic. But if you look at the sequence where she comes in, her knees are destroyed. Like her pants are bloody. It's really, really really like gore fest on her knees and her legs. Now yeah. you would believe from watching the film that that's just her jumping through the window. That was her running through the brambles. They set that up. That's makeup. That is 
actual damage to her actual legs from her throwing herself repeatedly every take onto the cement and onto the ground and dropping to her knees whenever she's getting hit or something throws her down. She physically throws her, herself around and she didn't have any padding to protect herself and she Damn. still did it. Oof. So like nice. I said, I don't know for sure if she went through the window. I don't remember anymore or not, but I will always remember that detail because I can never not see how damaged her legs are and how bloody those yeah. white pants are. And all along me watching this as a kid thinking that that was just makeup and that was just that's what she went through trying to get through the forest right Uh huh. the ending sequence where she is tied up to the chair that actually have arms underneath her and she's sitting there at the dinner yeah it's like 120 plus degrees in the room that they're at they have they're shooting in the day and they're trying to shoot day for night so all the windows are covered and they're covering it in black to keep the sunlight out which is transferring heat from the sun and the black into the house that they're in yeah then because it's so super dark and they're shooting day for night, they then have to light the place. So all of the hot lights from the 70s, like those big fucking really bright, really hot, burn yourself down to the bone lights are on in this room too. And they right. lit it like super bright to see all the horror that's going on. The cast and crew were also shooting for over like 20 some odd hours at this at this point. Like they were pulling pretty much an all-nighter. I think it was like hours and hours and hours and they were still there shooting. It was like almost 24 hours straight that they did this by the time they got to this scene. They're all really dehydrated. They're all super overheated. They're all physically exhausted and they're lacking sleep. Like everything that could possibly be going wrong for them physically is happening at this moment. So the look of total delirium on all of their faces, the sanity, the way that they all behave, the way that the shots were framed, all of the stuff that is like just absolutely a 20 minute sequence of nothing but abject horror. Like I still to this day when I watch it, that sequence where they get up and then you see them coming at the camera and it's her and then they cut back to her screaming and and just terrified and they go in close to her face and they do all of these different shots. I honestly believe that all they're doing is recreating the mania that they were in that overheated fucking room trying to shoot this. Yeah. It, it got bad in there. It got to the point where they started losing focus on reality and what was actually happening and at certain points they were the characters. All of the bad Jesus guys. Jesus Christ. There's a sequence when they go to feed grandpa, right? Yeah. They had a little fake pump of blood then they had tape over the blade and then they had a tube and Gunnar Hansen was supposed to squeeze the pump and get blood across her finger and then put it, fake blood across her finger and then put it into the mouth of the guy playing grandpa. It wasn't working. They kept trying and kept trying and kept trying. Gunnar loses his mind. And this, mm-hmm. this is in his words. He pulls the tape off and just cuts her finger because he wanted to get the shot done and it's so hot. He's he's obviously since apologized that's such a horrible thing. He still feels bad about it. But it had yeah, gotten- Yeah, it's pretty bad, dude. It had gotten that bad that he just cut her finger just to get the blood, just to get that shot over with. That's the story story that he tells on the commentary so that's coming directly from him Oof. but it was so bad in there that they really did that they lost touch with reality and the only person that really saw just how insane and awful this was was the cinematographer daniel pearl jesus christ yeah nobody else really knew just how intense this film actually was except for him and he was really having some issues with what he was seeing in, in this sequence like it, it really it really affected him and, yeah. and nobody else really even even realized it and i'll tell you what watching it on my projector it's the first time i've seen it on a big screen in a long time and i sat down watching this and the cinematography and those those sequences in particular you can feel the discomfort and the agony and the sweat and every piece of texture all the suffering is there on film and it is palpable like it draws you in and by the time we get to this sequence that insanity that that just sheer lack of like compunction because it's just so hot and they're so exhausted and everything just goes to the point where Gunner finally just cuts her finger just to get it over with for for that sequence. Just in imagining what that must be like, it's even more terrifying watching it because I'm really watching people losing their minds for real on screen, portraying these characters and losing touch with reality. Yeah. Like it's really fucking horrifying. This I mean, movie to hear all that still is fucking to this day. insane. Right. That's why I got to get it out. Like now that now that's everybody else's burden for the 300 episodes. You're welcome. <laughs> I, did, I <laughs> never even knew that. That's crazy. This is all just the shit that I can remember. This shoot, the way that they made this film is literally you watch these people suffer in real time on film constantly. And then they throw in a little bit of misery that just so happens to be their untimely demises. And those deaths feel that much more real because all you feel is just 
just discomfort and misery the entire time. The film yeah. never, and I mean never, gives you a moment's peace. The soundtrack it does not. Constantly, constantly berates your fucking ears. They're, they're making discordant music on purpose, and they're making these weird noises, and everything is designed to put you on edge from start to finish. And it's no wonder people couldn't handle this in 1974, 1973. It's no wonder yeah. it got banned. It's no wonder people were fucking terrified of it. I love it, and it still terrifies me when I watch it. I'm, I'm not still terrified of it. of it for crying out loud. <laughs> I've seen it more times than I can fucking count, and every fucking time, I'm still like just a little on edge after watching it because the movie does such a good fucking job. Man, I love the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I cannot get enough of it. No, I mean, it's, uh, and it's such great thing. It's a tightly packed horror movie, hour and 23 minutes. And not and it, a single one of them give you a sigh of relief or a single no, breath. No, not a minute of this movie is wasted. Like, not one minute where I sat there and went, ugh, all right, well, this is getting a little repetitive. It was constantly on edge, constantly, what are you going to see? Constantly, you know, what creepy, and this is the first time I'm ever watching it. When I, first time I ever watched it. Those were the old feelings I had. And, and now to this day, it's just entertainment from beginning to end. And when you still, like you said, and I'm the same way, you still get that jump scare and the dark with Leatherface killing Franklin to still have that for as many times as you and I have watched this movie is straight up amazing. Yeah, it's one of the most effectively made, almost entirely lightning in a bottle by accident by filmmakers that really may not have even known the power of what they were creating. Because yeah. I will tell you that I do not think that Tobey Hooper ever reached the height of what he was able to create with this film again. So I don't, I don't think so. I don't feel like this was intentional. I think they randomly happened into lightning in a bottle with this film and it just so happened to change the face of horror right after yeah. it came out. There are so many countless knockoffs of this film. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. It's it's like Mad Max syndrome with what this yeah. film created a ripple to this day, which I gleefully eat up like it's fucking candy. Every fucking Texas Chainsaw Massacre knockoff, I still watch them. I can't fucking help myself. I'll, <laughs> I mean, like... Just in case another one catches that lightning. <laughs> yeah, like, just in case another one feels as good as that one did. Like, and I get why they keep trying with this franchise and why it keeps getting worse. I totally do. But... <laughs> this one delivered so big time yeah you will and, never and catch that not only did it deliver again. yeah and not just that but it has a devoted fan base like yourself who will go watch all of these and they know that <laughs> yeah i mean i stopped by the time the remake came out um i yeah. never really got a chance to see any of the other ones in the theater and i was never interested in any of the remakes or rehashes or whatever leatherface the next generation and on i don't think i would probably want to see in the theater and i'm really kind of wondering what we're going to review are going to be like yeah i know right <laughs> for these like i'm, I'm still going to try and find nice things to say when i can yeah but like when there's problems with the filmmaking that i have i will i will describe that as well but anyway we're not going to dog on those to make this one sound better but what i'm getting yeah, at yeah. is i mean this we don't need to dog on other, other movies to make this one sound better <laughs> right it can't sound any better but what i'm getting at is one way or another they know that i'm going to watch that film they know that someone like me will watch that film and somehow they'll yeah. get a they'll get a dollar out of me for it at least you know even if i'm just tuning and into it on HBO. Like they know they're going to get my money. And it yep. it makes me angry that that this film is <laughs> that this film is so fucking good that it becomes the ultimate icon of exploitation to the point where my dollar is literally exploited every single time they reuse the title. <laughs> How dare you get to know me so well? <laughs> <laughs> How dare you market to me so effectively? <laughs> you jerks. No, I I fucking love this movie. I can never get enough of Texas Chainsaw Massacre and uh Matt will attest I usually watch them and eat chili. <laughs> You really do. <laughs> or some other type of meat. <laughs> no, no, it's it's chilly because of part two, and we'll get to that when we cover part yeah. two. But uh, I, yeah, I'm thinking we ran really long on just the movie review, which I knew that we would, but uh, let's, let's keep going. We'll just skip the news, and we'll go with the feedback that we got, okay? Sounds good. Are you having trouble keeping up with the ebbs and flows of modern geekery? Is the real world holding you back from knowing what is happening in the geeky world? To answer these and other personal problems brought in by your friends, gaming group, and loved ones, Geek Radio Daily presents daily informational sessions brought to you by the wonderful Billy Flynn, the Flynnstress, and podcasting's Rich Siegfried. They contain such helpful segments as history, geek birthdays, box office results, the latest in DVD and Blu-ray, 
video game, and comic releases. Why, they also have a Sweekly show hosted by the wonderful Billy Flynn and the Flynnstress, which includes interviews and commentary. And to make sure you are informed, Geek Radio Daily also provides you with your daily dose of geek news to make sure you know more than that jerk know-it-all Steve. Visit us at geekradiodaily.com. That's right, Geek Radio Daily. All the geek without the weight. Now available in fine Corinthian leather. This is the movie that Rex Reed called the most horrifying motion picture I have ever seen. This film is positively ruthless in its attempt to drive you right out of your mind. This is the horror movie to end them all. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre from New Line Cinema. Rated R. No one under 17 admitted without parent or guardian. saying man that score yeah <laughs> creepy as shit <laughs> big time all right so we've got three audio pieces of feedback and i think um some folks wrote like emails with them so i'm just gonna go in the order that they were received all right then time for incoming mail <laughs> oh there we go <laughs> yeah it is it's actually time for incoming mail all right, so our boy X from Kiss the Goat. By the way, Kiss the Goat's back, in case you didn't know, Matt. Hey, all right, Kiss the Goat. Yeah, in the email he says, seriously, well done, y'all. 300 episodes represent a weird kind of Peter Noth-like tenacity I can only dream of. <laughs> but X also was nice enough to give us some audio feedback. Here we go. Hey, y'all, my name's X from Kiss the Goat. And on behalf of my co-host Cootie, we want to say congratulations to Cinema PsyOps for smacking that 300 episode milestone right in the pink sock. Well done, Court and Matt. That is one hell of an accomplishment. Hail Satan, fuckers! Right in the pink sock. Right in the pink sock, man. I, I don't. He's... I don't know what a pink sock is, but it sounds like not some place you want to get knocked right into. It, it sounds painful. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid to look that up on Urban Dictionary because I wouldn't. Don't Google that. Yeah. X, don't Google that. X has already taught me so much more than I should have ever known, my man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next one we've got is from Alex. Hi, Court and Matt. Been an avid listener to your podcast since episode 67 when you covered one of my favorites, Motel Hell. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. I, that's why I brought it up. But we're covering Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Motel Hell. I love Motel Hell, but it's one of the ones that ripped off Texas Chainsaw. I mean, it was hey, very heavy heavily influenced by Texas Chainsaw, obviously. Anyway, uh, the rest of the letter, they go on. I thought I'd get more proactive to say thanks for the awesome podcast and congratulations on reaching 300. Cheers for all the laughs and introductions to new movies I would never have thought of watching and probably regretted seeing. <laughs> you're, you're, you're welcome for that. You're welcome, sir. Keep those podcasts coming. You guys rock. Cheers. Alex from Plymouth, UK, across the pond. Wow. Nice. <laughs> well, Wow, thank damn. you, Alex. So that's thank like you. it's like a first time email or long time listener, right? It goes back to yeah, like episode right? sixty seven. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. That's that's what I was hoping for. So thanks for reaching out, Alex. I really wanted to know that someone has been listening at least for that long and still likes us. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> this is in from Darren, our boy from the Psycho Semantic Podcast, also known as the Psycho Semantic Cast. Uh, he's yeah. also in the VD clinic. He's the D in the VD. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good for him. Uh, the <laughs> email says happy milestone, so I think I wasn't supposed to read that part, but here's the voice oh. message he sent us. 
Hey, Court and Matt. It is your buddy Darren, fellow Legionnaire of the Psycho Semantic Cast and VD Clinic Podcast. I wanted to make sure I took the time to say congratulations on your tricentennial 300th birthday, 300 episodes, week in, week out, the workhorse streak of productivity that you put out. That is an impressive tally. Congratulations on this moment. Here's your first 300. That's quite a streak. I want to also congratulate Matt on your singular accomplishment. It's not as big as 300 episodes, but 16 episodes since I responded to your email and you haven't opened it. That is also (laughs) quite a streak. Later. Homie called you out hard. Oh, Jesus Christ. Woo. (laughs) Woo. Woo. That's that's some fucking fire. All right. My bad. Uh... (laughs) Hey, he learned, though, because we said the only way to effectively get you to do anything is to shame you into it. Yeah, it really is. That Catholic yeah, he, guilt. That's a, that, I mean, it is. It's there right now, man. Oh. I'm feeling it. Yeah, that, oh. I can feel the heat from that burn over here, like yeah, on the other oh, side of the city, man. my man. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I feel, I don't feel like I'm going to, I'm going to be able to sleep tonight with that. Woo, that guilt's just <laughs> permeating in me. <laughs> I think Darren was raised Catholic too, so he knows how to make He you knows feel how to that. do it. Yeah, because yeah, I know how to guilt people too. <laughs> so, I mean, it helps. <laughs> All right, Woo! so this comes Well done, sir. Uh, well done. This one comes from <laughs> our man Pete from the Good Beer Bad Movie Night podcast, although it says Dr. Horror Brew here. And Pete, are you a hmm. horror host? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, it'd be cool if you were. I'm just asking. Yeah, it'd be a lot cooler if you did. <laughs> be a lot cooler if you also got the number of episodes right. So the <laughs> message says 500 episode. Congrats. Uh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Three. I don't feel that old. 300. We're not quite. That's like two more years. Yeah. So it says 500 episodes, question mark. All right. He's, <laughs> he's doing this on purpose. He's, he's being a dick. <laughs> Seriously, guys, get a job. I have yeah. one and I do this on in, in addition to that. <laughs> <laughs> Matt also get works a, a lot. Get a job. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want any more work than what I have oh, with this damn. podcast. Uh, no, da- what, you know what, Dad? Just leave me alone. Yeah, I'm going to live my life my way. I have the music in me. And that stripper star, we're in love. And we're going to have a <laughs> child. Do what you're doing to us, Pete. You shouldn't fuck yeah. around with our number count. Jesus, Pete. <laughs> All right, so Matt and Court, and he misspelled my name. Again, I don't know if that's on purpose or not. Probably. In He's all a real jerk. <laughs> In all honesty, I am astonished that not only have you vomited 500 shit-stained episodes into my ear holes. Wow. He's not, Jesus. He's not wrong. He's coming in hot. <laughs> <laughs> but also that you haven't actually killed each other in the process, and he also has a point. Well, I think this last whole COVID year of us not being in the same rooms helped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the smell factor was a big thing on always wanting to exterminate yeah. each other. Uh, yes, he, exactly. He goes on, it's nothing short of a miracle, and also not wrong. <laughs> no, no, yeah, not wrong at all. Thank you both very much, Pete. So I think Pete's sense of humor is the type where he wants to fuck with you, because that that, yeah. that whole email is like messing with me. Yes, pretty much. He's, he's, he came in hot, and he's fucking with us. <laughs> All right, so next one comes in from a man, Christopher Page, from the Time Shifters podcast and Orphaned Entertainment. Court and Matt. This is Christopher, your friend from over the Time Shifters podcast and Orphaned Entertainment podcast, and I am calling to say congratulations. Damn, 300 episodes, over five years of nonstop weekly podcasting. That is nothing short of amazing. If you aren't proud of yourself, then what the hell was wrong with you? Yeah, right. (laughs) He's got a point. True. Well, not all the films you cover are anything I would ever want to watch. Listening to you and Matt discuss them is always so much fun. Well, that's kind of part of the the plan in some cases. Yeah, right. We watch it so you don't have to. We're the Cliff's Notes of Exploitation. That's our new thing. Cinema PsyOps. Not because all physical wounds heal, but the the Cliff's Notes of Exploitation. I believe the episodes that first caught my attention may have been your discussions on subspecies and puppet master. Wow, he was hearing my bad Radu and and, uh, grandma or whatever the fuck she was, Radu's mom, those impressions, and he he still befriended us. He's got a good heart. (laughs) (laughs) It wasn't too long after that that I started 
good at dropping emails to the lair and even popping up on the show once or twice. Yeah, he guessed it quite a few yeah, times. That's yeah. right. I can hardly believe it was that long ago, but as I look back, yep, yep, it was. Man, again, to both of you, great job and congrats. This is really a milestone that should be celebrated. Christopher was one of our earliest supporters and one of the first podcasters that actually really reached out to us and kind of worked with us on stuff. Yes, yes. So it's kind of nice to see that he's still around with us, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. All right, so let me just uh, refresh here, see if we, anything else came in. No, that is it for the feedback. All right, so I think that's going to wrap up the fucking show, man. We've been doing this a lot longer than we have for weeks. Yeah, a lot more to talk about in this. <laughs> Let's wrap it up. But first, everybody that uh, got a hold of us, thank you so, so much for showing us a little love for being here for you for 300 weeks. I yeah, thanks, it. guys. That's great. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Mean Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com com itunes spotify stitcher youtube and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found hello anybody home sally i hear something stop the texas chainsaw massacre from New Line Cinema, rated R, no one under 17 admitted without parent or guardian. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. mentioned it earlier but uh, toby hooper hauled up with uh, another person and they made all of these weird discordant music that just like hurts your ears and really makes you wish it would just stop being played <laughs> <laughs> probably not a good choice to be closing out the episode with so maybe i'll just play some metal or some shit for at the very end because i want people to feel more relaxed and at ease the movie's over now everybody can be happy we, right. we made 300 episodes for you we're <laughs> we, we've made the longest episode we made in a really long time <laughs> true we already know that because uh, our, our man mike actually found out that uh, the episode that was the longest was our maniac cop full franchise fest yes that's right yeah so the way he did that he found that at our landing and launching page i would assume legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops so i gave you a shout out again mike and then i ham-fistedly segued into our website where i'm just telling everyone that's where you found it even though you, yeah. you probably used your podcatcher like a normal person. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> There's also our Facebook group where you can find me posting all of the memes that I am moving from our Instagram collection to our Facebook group and page. Cinema PsyOps is the name of both, the page and the group. The group is all capitals for PsyOps, and the page, it won't let me do it because for some reason capitals are screaming and they think it's impolite. Yeah. <laughs> but our show always that's, screams that's the end mean, of its though. title at you. We always scream everything. <laughs> I'm available at Facebook screaming into the void hoping that you'll notice me as court psyops <laughs> matt is there ignoring your emails if you're named darren as matt psyop sorry darren <laughs> you could try an email feedback to matt though he apparently won't respond for 16 solid weeks psyop matt at gmail.com um, i got a lot of shit going on with my life <laughs> if you want a response from a responsible adult, you can email feedback to court, cinemasyopscourt at gmail.com. I mean, adult. He's responsible. I don't know if I'd call him an adult, but... In a very legally binding sense, I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Le <laughs> the state recognizes him as the adult. <laughs> you can tweet a couple of tweets to a couple of half-wit twats on the hate-filled shitfest reformed into a porn bot heaven known as Twitter. <laughs> I'm at court underscore psyop there, and he is at psyop. Up, Matt. Just don't follow any uh, any uh, political Twitter accounts. You're gonna be fine. Yeah, and block anybody who makes it too political for you in a way that you don't agree with and you just don't want to hear. And that's how yeah. it works. They don't deserve discourse with you just because they feel like they do. I already mentioned right. our Instagram. That's cinema underscore psyops. That's where all of those sweet ass fucking tasty memes get repurposed for our people to share. Yeah, repurposed memes. They're not your memes. They're our memes. Well, folks, it's been. 300 consecutive weeks of the insanity of both Matt and myself in your ears. You already know what has to happen at this point, so just get it over with and kick the fuck out of this week and make it your bitch. <laughs> How's it going, man? I am, as of tomorrow this time, 100% vaccinated. Right now, I'm 99.9999999995 vaccinated. Yep, you, Bev, and... I will take your wife's name out of that because I use everything, but yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot. Yeah, you're recording. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you start recording on your side? And I am. One, two, three. So, you got yours... 
on the Star Wars Last day, right? Tuesday, yeah. Yeah, May the 4th. Wow. May the 4th. Well, was the 4th with you, and did you have residual side effects after you got yours? Um, I only had a little bit. Not the next day, but the day after, I ran a little bit of a fever. I had a few people that said that, too, that um, like that, that seemed to be the thing that they got the following day. Yeah, is, uh, like when my cheeks were really flushed, like red, which you never see. It's almost like it was in a hot room for a long time. Oh, hang on. I got something that I got to download here. That's uh, our buddy Christopher in the background. So this is um, this is going to be uh, the 300th episode. We got a couple of congratulations. I was actually able to get people to sneak some in on time. Awesome. Yeah, I was very stoked about that. Uh, that was, yeah. <laughs> and what I basically did was I just opened it up and I'm like, we're just going to celebrate the end of five years and the fact that we made it 300 episodes for the next yeah. 13 episodes. <laughs> I mean, why not? <laughs> That's the way that I see it. I mean, I That's, think we've earned it. <laughs> sounds like a way to work it. <laughs> yeah. And also, it just gives the opportunity for whoever wants to send something. If they want to, they, they have that capability. Option. They can now do that. Yeah. Yeah, of course. What the fuck? We're doing a great franchise. Well, great idea for a franchise. <laughs> We're doing a great couple of movies in an otherwise really played out shit fest of a franchise, but let's not get too deep into it and ruin the review for That's the true. next five movies. <laughs> 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 for whatever it's going to be. <laughs> um, let me make sure that you hear this okay on your side. Hang on just a sec. Yeah, you're not hearing that, are you? I hear it. It's light, though. Better. That's perfect. All right, let me turn it up a little bit so I can hear it better. That's weird. I don't hear it nearly as well as you do. Oh. Well, now oh. I'm, start I'm starting to hear, like, buzzing. Oh, you do hear the buzzing? Yeah. All right, then that's coming through from that same thing. God damn it, I can't, I can't have it both ways. That's because my stuff, I cut it out whenever I'm not talking, so it, it blocks out on my side of the recording is what I'm getting at whenever I'm not talking. But, I gotcha. But do you still hear it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I do not hear the buzzing, but I hear the, the voice just fine. I hear yeah. the voice and I hear no buzzing. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I got the signal to noise ratio right in the sweet spot of recording. <laughs> right in the old sweet spot. Yeah. Five fucking minutes later. Why don't we start the fucking show? Fucking A. <laughs> All right. Here we go in our next clip. So we're going to be pushing the Christian agenda right down your fucking throat. Wrong one. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, come on, you fucking bastards. It keeps, keeps selecting the wrong thing. Here we go. But I'm so used to being so filled with vitriol and hate for him. It's because you're getting older. It's get, getting older, my friend. You're getting softer. <laughs> I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Maybe it's because watching it this time around, I realized on any kind of trip, I am Franklin. <laughs> well, you're not, you know, because no one has to take care of you. <laughs> You're able to take care of yourself. No, I just meant that I'm the fucking drag there that doesn't like when everybody else is having fun and doesn't want to be around them. That's me. <laughs> how, how dare you have fun in the wrong way? <laughs> no, not have fun in the wrong way. Just like you are irritating when you're having fun. That's all. Yes, you specifically. Wait, wait, wait. wait. That sounded like, yeah, it sounded like you're, uh, you're just talking to me now or... <laughs> <laughs> Look, if you're looking around the room and you're wondering who it is I'm meaning when I say you specifically, <laughs> it's probably you. It's probably me. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, don't mind me. I'll just be over here crying. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's not so much you. It's more or less other people that come along with you on trips, Matt. So. All right. There. You know what? Uh, I can accept that. <laughs> yeah, you kind of got a point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not editing all of any of this out. Fuck that. <laughs> Fuck it. Yeah, this is this fucking all stays. Well, it's going um, in all, it's going in outtakes, obviously. But let, let's yeah, go. of course. Next one we've got is from Alex. Hi, Court and Matt. Been an avid listener to your podcast since episode 67. When real quick, real quick. Time out. Yeah. I thought I didn't know it was going to be an email. I thought it was going to be another kind of like a, a, a recording. Uh -huh. I'm like, wow, this guy sounds just like Court. <laughs> Well, that's a great outtake, actually. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, holy, holy shit. Yeah, I'm, gonna do, I'm just going to start over from the beginning. On this right. one. He goes on. I thought I'd be more proactive. I should say they go on. You know, I just realized he mentioned Motown Hell. I never got into why uh, my criticism of their barbecue style. Oh, well, uh, I'll punch it in and we'll move on to the voicemail from here. So go ahead. Just give me a count right. in. Yeah, uh, three, two, one. Now, if I play the uh, voice messaging and it's the same thing that he wrote here, then I will not have me reading it. All right, then. 
Court and Matt. This is Christopher, your friend from over the Time Shifters podcast and Orphaned Entertainment podcast, and I am calling to say congratulations. Damn! 300 episodes over five years of nonstop weekly podcasting. Yep. Dropping yeah. emails to the lair and even popping up on Whoops. the show once or twice. Oh, I wow. totally <laughs> believe it was that long ago, but as I look back... I wonder if it sent the transcript, because that was exactly what he just yeah, wrote to me. It, it must have. Okay, so maybe that just should be an outtake, because that's fucking hilarious. Not me I reading the this. entire thing, but just like this whole discussion. Yeah, yeah that's, that's fucking that's hilarious. That's so funny. <laughs> that's so funny. It's funny. <laughs> it's funny everywhere, even in here and out there. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny the everywhere. Grand jury investigation. Ray robbing in Texas is this hour's top news story. An informant led officers of the Muerto County Sheriff's Department to a cemetery just outside the small rural Texas community of Newt early this morning. Officers there discovered what appeared to be a grisly work of art, the remains of a badly decomposed body wired to a large monument. A second body was found in a ditch near the perimeter of the cemetery. Subsequent investigation has revealed at least a dozen empty crypts, and it's feared more will turn up as the probe continues. Deputies report that in some instances, only parts of a corpse had been removed. The head, or in some cases, the extremities removed, the remainder of the corpse left intact. Evidence indicates the robberies have occurred over a period of time. Sheriff Jesus Maldonado refused to give details in the ghoulish case and said only that he did have strong evidence linking the crime to elements outside the state. Area residents have reportedly converged on the cemetery, fearing the remains of relatives have been removed. No suspects are in custody as the investigation at the scene continues. Kick the fuck out of this week and make it your bitch. All right, as far as I'm concerned, that's the the out. <laughs> there, there you go. That works for me. Fucking a. <laughs> God damn! I knew this was going to be a long one. So. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, there's just so much to unpack and talk about with this one. So. Yeah, and I. This is a good one to do. I held back too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, you could have. We could be in here for four hours talking about this movie. I know because I've Especially seen with us all the, do it at the bar. Yeah, <laughs> yes, we have. Yeah, that's <laughs> fucking true. <laughs> well, everybody else is like it. going somewhere else and leaving these two weirdos alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I was always like, God, I, I was really surprised some of the Romero stuff didn't make us last into the wee hours of the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, found a way to get that all out too. So yeah. All right, are you still recording? <laughs> yeah, but I'm going. to to be stopping here now.